So this is lecture three for Bio 412 Comparative Genomics. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the Human Genome Project. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the history of the Human Genome Project and um, try to understand uh, you know, the progression of research or, or how human genomic research has progressed and how it's currently being implemented. Um, and then try to think about, well, how is comparative genomics um, important for our understanding of human biology? So first off, uh, here's a few little trivia questions for you. Um, and uh, before you go ahead in this video to see what the answers are, um, I, I would encourage you to take a second, see if you can answer these questions, see what your guess is on. Right, so how many base pairs are there in the human genome? How much did it cost to sequence the first human genome? Just take a guess. How long did it take to sequence the first human genome? Um, when was the first human genome sequence completed? And uh, whose genome was it? So uh, in case you're curious, uh, think about it all for a second, and then I'll give you the answers right about now. So <laughs> uh, if you don't want to hear the answers yet, pa hit pause, and you can think on it. But here are the answers. Um, so uh, the human genome is about uh, 3 billion bases long. The haploid copy of the human genome, about 3.2 billion bases long. Um, it cost almost $3 billion to sequence it. Um, so uh, quite a, an endeavor. Um, how long did it take us? About 13 years to generate the first human genome sequence. We can now do them in like, I don't know, how long does it take to sequence a genome now? Probably 48 hours. Uh, 24 hours. <laughs> it it uh it goes pretty fast. Depends on the platform you're using. Um, when was the first human genome sequence completed? Uh, uh, sometime between 2000 and 2003, and let's say sort of, but not really, because uh, even when we said it was complete, it wasn't really complete, complete. And finally, whose genome was it? It was um, several different peoples, but it was mostly uh, a dude from Buffalo. So, um, well, we've, I'm going to use an analogy here, which uh, I took from my old post advisor, but is not really one that you might might resonate with you. But uh, we'll see how it goes. So, remember back in the day, there were these things called phone books, right? You used to get them. You still kind of do get them every now and then, but they used to be big. They used to be thick. Now they're pretty narrow. So you used to get these giant books, phone books, right? So imagine a phone book is sort of our unit of measure. If we were to think about the human genome as compared to some genomes from some other organisms, we could look at something like a, like a chromosome or a, a whole bacterium, right? And its genome is gonna be about 300 pages long, 300 pages of that phone book. Whereas we look at not even a whole phone book, right? Just a piece of it. Whereas we look at something like a yeast chromosome, right, that's going to be more about, you know, about the same size as that whole uh, e, e. coli um, genome. And so what we're talking about here is a genome, you know, somewhere probably around like three to six million base pairs. Um, then we get to yeast, right? This is um, the one of the uh, smallest uh, human genomes, uh, sorry, uh, eukaryotic genomes. Um, and so we could call this one book. We move further down and we get to Drosophila. We're talking about 10 books long in terms of the genome. And we think of the human genome, right, with, with uh, its thousand pages in each telephone book. And we've got at least 200 telephone books lined up, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, it's just meant to show that, like, this is the scale that we're talking about the human genome. So when we think about, you know, the time it took to sequence some of these things and how we actually, you know, the process that went through it, you know, we started with a lot of these smaller things because they were a lot easier to sequence. And even then, they were still pretty challenging. Um, so this is one of the reasons why the human genome actually took us so long to do. It was a much bigger undertaking. Um, if you're ever interested in learning more about like uh, the human genome, there's there's um, and how we use genomics in humans. Up, these are some some nice resources to look at. I think um, the gene, which is also there's a I think there's a PBS special that's associated with it too um, that you might be able to find. Um, 
that's a it's a really interesting I think well presented um, um, nonfiction um, account of you know the role of the gene and genetics in society and it deals with some of the um, things related to the human genome the human genome project talks about how we use genetics as humans uh, another kind of fun one is um, genome war which is about sort of the race to um, to uh, uh, to sequence the human genome and it was actually a pretty um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, exciting thing and dynamic thing at, during that period of time so um, a lot of the main players involved uh, who were competing with Craig Venter, J. Craig Venter, to uh, sequence the human genome are actually just based up the road at um, uh, UC Santa Cruz. So um, there are a lot of people there who were instrumental in actually um, getting the sequence, the public version of the sequence, uh, the first human genome sequence, out and available um, before um, uh, uh, Solera in the group there, J. Craig Betcher's group. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. Um, so if we think about how did we get to a human genome, um, so uh, there is, um, uh, you know, in 1953, uh, Watson and Crick um, announced the, the structure of DNA and um, were given credit for discovering it. Um, a lot of their work uh, was largely theoretical. That was really the work of Rosalind Franklin, which was used as evidence to show that um, their idea of a double helix was uh, uh, was the the right idea. Linus Pauling had kind of come out. Um, he and his group had come out saying it was a, it was, a, it was a, not a double helix, but a triple helix. Um, and it was really Rosalind Franklin's work, which was really important there, but um, she's kind of one of these um, women in the history of biology or history of science who have been, have been lost. Unfortunately, um, she passed away before uh, Watson and Crick were given the Nobel Prize, so she wasn't able to be considered in that as well. Um, but she was incredibly important in this discovery. Um, in I'm skipping over a bunch of things that happened in between just so you know but um, we only have so much time so <laughs> uh, if we jump ahead to 1975 um, that's where um, Sanger and colleagues and um, Maxim and Gilbert started developing methods for actually the sequencing of DNA so <clears throat> 1953 we could observe it but we couldn't tell what its sequence was um, we knew it was made out of nucleotides but you know getting the actual sequence of them was really hard and difficult and so um, by 1975 um, Sanger had come up with um, a method for sequencing and that method was uh, eventually developed and became sort of the dominant method for DNA sequencing for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> in 1980 the US Supreme Court ruled that uh, genetically modified bacteria are patentable and this was a uh, this was a big deal right so um, I think you'll find that the one of the interesting things in, in genetics, um, and for those of you who are interested in this stuff, is there's a lot of law involved. Um, so there's different ways to think about, you know, how um, biology sort of intersects with society uh, in these cases. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as the class goes on. But um, we really saw that, you know, the, the U.S. Supreme Court um, had quite a big effect on, um, on, on, on these systems. Uh, but by making this passing the, or passing this law um, and you can see that echoing today in things like um, you know genetically modified crops and um, who has ownership of those genes etc <coughs> um, in 1981 we had our first sequence of the human mitochondrial uh, DNA or mitochondrial genome right and that's we can see that over here on the right side uh, mitochondrial genome is a lot smaller than the human genome right only about 17 16 and a half thousand base pairs long um so it's a lot easier to sequence it's also haploid so uh, you don't have to worry about um have, uh, variation for the most part within an organism so it's a lot easier to sequence uh in 2084 um we had our first viral genome sequence and that was uh the sequence of epstein-barr virus it's about 172,000 base pairs long. Uh, 
Um, and then <coughs> as the 80s went, uh, bled into the 90s, um, we started um, with a greater focus on genomics and human genomics. So um, in 1990, uh, the Human Genome Project was launched. Um, and from that, um, we first had to establish sort of like the standards um, for how we were going to, you know, protect people and their, and their rights. Uh, we had our first U.S. genome centers established in the early 90s. Um, we then had to generate um, genetic maps, and these were quite laborious to generate at the time. Um, also in the early 90s, uh, we see down here there was the formation of the Institute for Genome Research, or TIGER. Uh, Tigger, uh, uh, founded by um, J. Craig Venter. Um, and this became a private organization that was often in direct um, competition with U.S. government, U.K. government, other governments. Um, and really one of the preeminent biotech um, organizations in the early 90s. Um, in the as the 90s progressed we had some other centers pop up the sanger institute um, later renamed the welcome sanger institute um, we have uh, collaborators um, i know some people there now who still work and it's still an active place of research they are heavily involved in, for instance in um, the darwin tree of life and the vertebrate genome project and earth biogenome projects um, as the 90s progressed we ended up with um, our first genetic map, so mapping out genes and their locations onto chromosomes, um, right? We had this uh, physical map achieved. Um, we then uh, had our first bacterial genome sequenced in 95. Um, in 96, we had our first archaic, archaeal genome, and then yeast. Our first yeast genome was sequenced. Um, so that was a big deal. Uh, so now we're starting to move on to genomes that have gone on, you know, beyond um, just a few million base pairs to now pushing into tens of millions of base pairs or megabases long. Um, as we go into the late 90s, uh, more genomic institutes start to pop up, like JGI, um, the Joint Genome Institute. Um, we get the creation of the National Human Research Institute. Uh, e. coli is sequenced. Uh, the French get involved. The Japanese get involved. Um, we see uh, targets now for your, what we assume to be the number of genes in the genome, which are around 30,000 uh, base pairs. Um, the first sequence comes out for C. elegans. Um, we have our uh, Chinese Genome Institute so everyone seems to be getting on the genome scale but you know where's that human genome well we just get our full-scale human genome sequencing going um, in 1999 right and so um, we're also we managed to finish the first uh, sequence of the first uh, human chromosome chromosome 22 and uh, it starts moving quickly actually uh, around this time uh, I think the uh, J. Craig Venture Institute said that they could finish um, sequencing the genome by 2003, and that really sort of pushed the public institutions, uh, the NHGRI, to really sort of start get going. And by 2000, they had created a, a draft uh, version of the human genome sequence. And uh, Clinton and Tony Blair came out and um, came out in support of, of this um, sequence and said it should be free and accessible, which is a big deal, right? So they're competing with this private organization and they're the, the governments are trying to, to finish the genome sequence first so that they can release it and have it be public instead of having it be private and not accessible. Um, at the, around the same time, we finished, finished the fruit fly uh, genome sequence, which is what about like 100 uh, 140 or so uh, megabases or larger, 140, something like that. Um, we had mustard cress or Arabidopsis genome sequenced, which is a little more than 100 uh, million, uh, 100 megabases long. Uh, we had the first draft version of the human genome sequence published in 2001. 
Um, and uh, when we say draft, right, it's not the entire version. It's just um, assembled pieces of the human genome, which might cover most of it, but it's not necessarily arranged appropriately um, onto chromosomes and things of that sort. So it's not at the place where we would really use it for a reference. Uh, early 2000s, we had our first mouse genome, right? And then finally, in 2003, we end up with our um, finished version. We'll put finished in quotes um, because it wasn't really complete. There were plenty of parts of the human genome that actually weren't done when we, when we declared it finished. Um, but at that point, um, the large majority of the uh, human genome was well assembled. Um, but there were lots of problematic areas that still had to be sussed out. So, you know, we've still been um, tinkering with pieces of it now for a while. And so it was actually just recently in 2020 where um, scientists at the NIH, um, Sergey Korin and um, many of the researchers there have come out and, and finally said that we've got a telomere to telomere sequence for the human genome. So. Um, looks like we may finally have our, our complete human genome sequence. Um, for a, maybe a, a nice little, I, I asked you guys to look um, and, and look over this re resource, which came out in 2021. Um, and this is an, uh, a sort of an, an issue put out by Nature on the Milestones in Genomic Sequencing. And it goes through, um, you should definitely listen to um, this interview in, from 2017. Um, I think it's worth looking at it kind of speaks to where we were i mean about four or five years ago so it's a little bit dated now but shows you kind of uh the prog some of the progressions as we move into the 21st century of where sequencing is uh, but it's a nice recounting of um you know some of the key steps in the genome uh sequencing uh, uh a nice little video on how the worm showed us the way to open science um, talks about a lot of the um, important um, uh, milestones that hit on the way and, and, and points that had really big influence on the field. Um, uh, there's a nice discussion here. We'll, we'll play around with the UCSC genome browser at some point too. Um, there are uh, some discussions on a, a bunch of different topics related to genome sequencing, um, how we moved into sort of the next generation of genome sequencing, um, where we are now with sort of personal uh, genomes and population scale genomics, and um, how we've moved beyond genomics now to you know, transcriptomics and epigenomics and computational biology, um, and so this tells us, you know, where we're sort of, where we were and where we're, we've headed and, and some of the key steps along the way. Um, uh, here's another uh, UCSC uh, feature, on the, another UCSC uh, a faculty member, member Bess Shapiro does excellent work on ancient DNA, really cool stuff. Um, so uh, I would definitely, uh, you know, will we'll you have to, for the discussion, kind of click through this, find something you're interested in and check it out. Um, I think there's some um, excellent uh, points here, and so this is uh, just a little discussion too on that telomere to telomere example that I just brought up. So you can access that through the Canvas site, and the discussion is there as well. So moving on. Uh, so we had the human genome it was first published in 2000 2021. It took about 10 years to finish and cost about three billion dollars. And if we think about where we are now, uh, basically, you know, you can spit in a tube and get a genotype for about 100 to 200 bucks, right? 23andMe, um, Ancestry DNA, like whatever you want to use. Um, you can get your full genome sequence, the full actual genome sequence, probably for something around like 800 to 1,000 um, dollars. It's 2.2. If we think about the characteristics of the human genome, it's 2.2 gigabases long, so 3.2 billion bases long. Um, there are 22 paired chromosomes or autosomes, and then there are two heterogametic chromosomes, the X and the Y. A couple of heterogametic, um, since they are not um, paired in the same way that autosomes are. Uh, 
Uh, how many genes does it have? Well, you know, back in the day we thought, well, there's got to be about 100,000 genes, and then we thought it was 30,000, and then we thought it was 25,000, and then we thought it was 20,000, and now we think it might be less, more like maybe like 18 or 19,000. Um, the number of genes does sort of change periodically, and you might be wondering, well, what gives? Why does it keep on changing? Um, well, as we learn other techniques, like we learn transcriptomic techniques, and um, as we dig into the function of things, we learn to redefine what we might consider to be a gene. And these early numbers, too, were based on sort of like what people expected, the amount of complexity that you would need, the amount of functional elements you would need to actually have uh, something as complex as a human being. Um, but what we ended up finding was that you could have a lot less genes if there were things like alternative splicing going on. Right, and and so that that kind of changed the program because initially there was this assumption that you know basically we were going to go from having you know protein coding sequence directly to protein, so we needed a lot of these different types of things. Um, but you know, in fact, these genes, even for as important as they are, they only make up about two to three percent of our entire genome. Um, we talked a little bit about this later, um, so. It, you know, when it comes down to it, it seems like, well, that's not that much of our genetic code that's sort of trying to explain who we are, like what makes us up. If you think about it, like two to three percent of our 3.2 billion bases long, that's it. That's the only thing that is accounting for all that we are. It seems a little bit lacking, right? But that's in, in a lot of ways because we're forgetting a lot of other things. In fact, some scientists might estimate that there's up to 80% of our genome which is functional. And I'll talk about the reason why for that is in a second, but um, that maybe starts to jive with sort of the level of complexity arguments that people made back in the day. You know, we have alternative splicing, where, you know, where we have different exons being arranged into different sequences that can lead to different protein sequences coming from the same genome. But there's also this whole part of when things are expressed. So these promoter regions, these transcriptional control sites, often end up having a big effect on how um, genetics works and genomes function. Um, so to think about all those, that 80%, like where did that 80% number come from? Well, it came from uh, a pretty big effort uh, by a group um, known as ENCODE, which is the ENCYC, stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. This was a really big initiative, um, and they published a ton of papers on this topic, uh, special issues. And um, one of the things that ENCODE did was um, ENCODE looked not only at um, the genes that were in the genome, but they looked at everything else. So things that were under epigenetic control. So things that were control that were promoters, things that were binding sites, things that were expressed but maybe not coding for proteins, um, repetitive elements, promoters, enhancers, um, all these uh, insulators, all these other factors that help control the expression of a gene and genome that we see big shifts during development and um, it, during environmental stresses and things like that in the in the types of things that are expressed, the types of genes that are expressed, and the types of transcripts. So we even see different alternatively spliced transcripts being expressed in different contexts, which could lead to different proteins being produced in different contexts. So um, we see different genes being turned on and turned off. Sometimes it has to do with the, the, the three-dimensional structure of DNA, which is something we often don't um, we haven't historically been good at thinking about. So you can see that there's a lot, uh, you know, it's not just the genes that account for the complexity that is us. There's a lot of other components, other DNA elements that are contributing to um, uh, the phenotypes that produce the human. So to do this and to understand this, right, the human genome sequence becomes super important because we need to not only understand the coding sequence, we need to understand all the parts, all the other parts as well. We need to know what they are and be able to um, use that reference material uh, and rely upon it. Uh, so just because we got one reference genome sequence didn't stop um, work in human genomes. 
Um, it, we then went on a series of other projects that followed up on it, the International HapMap Project, which was looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms and DNA sequence variation among different regions around the world. And this can kind of be seen over here on the right, right? These are some of the different sites and different peoples that were associated with this. Uh, there are a variety of different um, genome projects as well um, that we're trying to encompass like the thousand genomes project um, that we're trying to uh, get more broad samples of the genetic variation in populations to try to get a better understanding of the breadth of human genetic variation um, because you know if we're going to use the human genome as a re as a reference right a lot of it you know if it's just sort of based on one dude from Buffalo, a lot of our assumptions are going to end up being based on that dude from Buffalo. Um, in addition to that, we had um, about, uh, there are other uh, more recent initiatives in genome sequencing, like the 100,000 plus genome projects for England, Asia, and the US, the Cancer Genomics Atlas, the Human Pan Genome Reference Sequence Project, which is right up the road at UCSC. Uh, and then um, there's the NIH, all of us, which is supposed to be basically over a million people or more genome sequenced. And now if you look across the world, you can find like there's tons of um, genome sequencing projects throughout the world. Um, lots and lots of different uh, countries and organizations all doing genome sequencing of their population. Um, because it's been shown that these types of initiative can have a really um, uh, a strong effect on our understanding of health outcomes and um, things that can affect people's health. Um, so by understanding genetics, right, we're really getting a much better understanding of the phenotypic things that we're observing and how the environment interacts with our genomes, right? So the environment will interact with different variations in different ways. And so by having this broad, better sense of all the variation that we see in humans, we're getting a much better sense of how um, we'll react to different um, medical contexts. Um, one of the, I think one of the interesting cases is when we think about, okay, now we've got all this genetic information, but, you know, how does that then help us intersect and understand human biology, right? And it's really kind of interesting because if, if you think about like what a genome is like if you take yeast and you start throwing mutants into yeast there's about like I think 80% of the genome you can toss a mutant into and if you knock out one gene 80% um, of them the organism can still survive so it's a pretty robust system Right? Like you knock out a gene, the whole organism can still survive, but 20% of them are lethal. Right? You knock out that gene and it dies. But so that means that like it can take a lot of a lot of um, change, a lot of variation. Um, but it's a really chaotic system because what happens is you have these small changes that periodically can lead to really big changes, right? Um, so you have small changes that can lead to large changes. But you still have this, this this system which is pretty robust to lots of specific changes so it's kind of paradoxical in that way like most of the time a little change doesn't have a big effect but every now and then it'll have a huge it'll have a huge effect right so it becomes really difficult to study um and we end up with kind of having like the these kind of two dominant paradigms of how we can use genetics to sort of understand human biology um, and one of them is, um, you know, we can look at the, the study of human mutation. So we can see, like, how variation in humans affects various phenotypic properties or phenotypes, right, that are specific to humans. So we don't see them in other organisms, um, or there we can, we can sort of isolate them specifically to humans, right? And so if we study these patterns of mutation, then we can really better understand these these specific phenotypes because um, that tells us you know how differences can account for these different outcomes and you know we see this in things like um, the study of cancer so for this is how we were able to understand like the specific variants that were associated with like the 
the BRCA1 and BRCA2 tumor suppressor genes and their relationship to breast cancer, or the more recent um, Oncotype DX and Mammoprint um, uh, uh, tests that have been developed to screen for um, breast cancer risks, where we now know a lot about, say, 21 or 70 other genes that um, that uh, where mutations could put someone at risk. So by understanding these patterns and these mutations, these variations in different people and their relationships, the phenotypes, we can start to better understand the genetics that underlies our biology, right? So how the genetics affects our biology and, and take action based upon that, right? More frequent screening, um, you know, making, helping people be aware of what to look for in these cases. And then, you know, you could extend this now to where we have personal genome sequencing, right? Where we were able to parse out ancestry and health through an app on our phone after we submit a sample. It's pretty wild. And this is the way that we expect to go too, right? Like we're digging deeper into this space almost every day. Um, there will be a day when everybody will probably get their genome sequenced right around the time they're born and that will help us understand and predict some of the risks that might be involved in their health. Um, another way that we can think of though, rather than studying the variation in humans or the patterns of mutations in humans, is by looking at comparative genomics, right? So in, in how can we understand our own biology? Well, we can look for the similarities and the differences between um, our genome and another species genome and see like how those uh, um, how what those differences are, and then you know how do the what are these changes in loci doing? Like what are these genetic differences accounting for? Um, and that's where comparative genomics comes in. So all both of these questions are sort of trying to get at the key entity here, which is what makes us human, right? What are the things that makes us human? And so a classic way to think about this is as comparison to our, our closest uh, living homin, uh, primate relative, which is uh, the chimpanzee, right? And so if we think about um, humans versus chimpanzees, depending upon how you calculate it, uh, they're somewhere around like 96 to 98% similar at the genome level, right? And if we think about um, something like fruit flies, like Drosophila melanogaster and Drosophila simulans, they're, they're like 5% divergent at the DNA level. So they're a lot more divergent than we are. So fruit flies are more, are more, are more different from each other than we are from chimpanzees. Um, and this only accounts for about uh, 13 million bases of our 3.2 billion bases in, in different sequence, although the chimpanzee ge uh, genome is actually a little bit larger than ours. Um, what that means that at the protein level is that 30% of um, the homologous human chimp proteins are, are identical, right? And that there is only an average difference of like two amino acids between <laughs> um, proteins um, when you do comparisons. But that doesn't mean that it matches for everything, right? So then if you do things like if you look at... Um, if you look at uh, olfactory receptor genes, for instance, we do see like a big difference there where 40% um, uh, um, if we, there's, there's about a thousand olfactory receptor genes in human chimpanzee and 40% of them we find in human and about 70% have these open reading frames in chimps. So there are, you know, that would indicate that the chimps have a lot more diversity in their olfactory receptor genes than the humans do. So you, we definitely see that there are, are big different, that there are differences sometimes in the suite of genes um, that are available and utilized in these groups. Um, one of the ways that we look at uh, differences in humans and chimpanzees is we would look in and we'd calculate and see if there's evidence that the genes are under positive selection. And so what does that mean, a gene is under positive selection? At its base, it means that, that things are evolving more rapidly than we would expect by chance, right? That's positive selection. Things are changing more rapidly than we would expect by chance. Alternatively, things could be staying stable much longer than we would expect to them by chance. By chance, we would expect things, if there was no selection, completely neutral, we'd expect things to change at kind of a, a certain rate, right? 
And so what we do is we can look at two proteins in comparison and we can calculate the number of differences which we see in between those two proteins and figure out if when we look at the DNA if the differences that we're seeing are due to synonymous mutations right or if they're due to non-synonymous mutations remember the non-synonymous mutation is going to change the amino acid sequence change in the DNA changes the amino acid sequence synonymous uh, uh, change will not change the sequence. So if we think about um, uh, uh, where we have like um, a neutral case, right? Sort of like the the sort of the very basic theoretical way to explain that is like if non-synonymous changes are changing at the same rate as synonymous changes, then that's effectively neutral, right? Like there's no selection one way or the other. It's just like they're both changing. And and so because they're pretty much equal, we say well there's no evidence of positive selection things aren't changing more rapidly, they're not changing slower, they're just changing at a, at a steady rate. Um, if we say things are um, mutating, uh, or if there's a evidence of purifying selection, what we're saying there is that we see way more synonymous changes than non-synonymous changes. So if we compare the ratio of the two, of non-synonymous to synonymous, we get a value that's less than one. Right, and that's because we have more synonymous changes than non-synonymous changes. And the idea there is that there's purifying selection. So a gene can't change its protein, protein sequence because it's so important, it's so key to whatever function it does, that selection is working against mutation and variation in that gene. And finally, you have the case where we have positive selection, right, where we have more non-synonymous changes, more amino acid change, than we have non-synonymous changes where we're not having amino acid change. And in this case, that's we're seeing more change than we would expect to see by chance. And that's the signal of positive selection. And so when we look at genes in comparison to human and chimpanzee, what we see are the genes that tend to be under positive selection are associated with things like tumor suppression and apoptosis, spermogenesis, sensory perception, immune defense, uh, genes exp uh, expressed in the testis, and genes on the X chromosome. So these are some of the ways that we can start to see things that could be uh, contributing to the differences between humans and chimpanzees. Um, a classic case to focus in on is an example of um, a gene like FOXP2 um, or 4 k box protein 2, right? And, and FOXP2 is a transcription factor that um, is involved in the developmental pathways of, uh, that are associated with, with speech uh, or language development, right? And it's often referred to as the speech gene. So it's involved in brain development. I spelled that wrong, my bad. Um, and it's interesting because we know that like mutations in this gene can lead to things like ver uh, developmental verbal uh, dyspraxia. Um, so there's a classic example of this um, British KE family where they had um, sort of severe facial motor control and mental processing of language problems. And it was largely due to the fact that there was an arginine mutation in their um, uh, uh, in their copy of this gene that then destabilized the DNA binding capacity of this transcription factor and inhibited its function, right? So, but this is a case where we see evidence of positive selection. There's basically two, um, two mutations, two changes that have happened between um, all of these other organisms and humans and for whatever reason, these two changes are um, really important for the function of um, FOXP2. Um, and you have to remember, this is a transcription factor. So what it's actually doing is it's binding the DNA and it's promoting transcription, which means it's probably affecting multiple targets, like lots and lots of targets. So it can have an effect on just on more than one thing. So you know, genetic change in just you know, some very straightforward genetic change in just this one copy would then lead to um, echoes of change in lots of other pathways. And again, this is just pointing out sort of um, the changes that we would expect to see here, right? Where um, if we go, if we went, if we look at, at this case here, right, where we had um, 
uh, 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 threonine, right? And we went to uh, an asparginine, right? So in this case at the DNA level, we would have had to have gone from something that was um, maybe ACC um, to um, AAC, AAC, right? So we had to have at least one change, and it would have happened in this second position of this um, of this codon, and generally those types of changes can lead to um, uh, 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 in a second position are thought to happen more rapidly. Be an example of rapid evolution, um, especially when they're so conserved throughout the rest of this spot. Um, but if it was another one of these sequences, I don't actually don't know what the DNA sequence is in human, um, but if it was another one of these, right, it would have involved even more than one DNA change just to get from a, th a threonine to an aspartame. It would involve at least two DNA changes, right? Two things would have had to change. Well, maybe not this one. This, this ACT could have changed to AAT. Uh, but you get the point. Uh, another way that... Um, people have been thinking about the differences between humans and chimps is by looking at things like brain expression. So sure, we're not that different at a gene level, but we could be very different in terms of the patterns of gene expression. When genes are expressed, where they are expressed at different times during development in different environments and in different instances, right? And this is a paper that was published in PNS back in like 2009. And what they saw in this paper was that if you looked at um, uh, the proportion of differentially expressed genes in different tissues um, when you compared human to chimpanzees, right? What you've tended to find was that overall um, transcription factors were more differentially expressed in human brain as compared to chimp brain. You can see that over here right here. And of these transcription factors, um, these primate-specific uh, um, crab zinc finger proteins were especially um, differentially expressed in human versus chimp. And if you looked at what this ended up doing is you end up having these um, two networks of genes that were looked to be controlled by uh, these transcription factors. Um, and um, basically the ones in red are genes that are upregulated in human and the ones in green are ones that are downregulated in human as compared to chimpanzee. And so we can start to see like whole how these transcription factors can have effects on whole suites of genetic pathways, right? And that we end up with a, a module of things that could be um, um, driving differences in brain development and brain function. So this is just that some of the examples and ways that we can use comparative genetics to understand um, human chimpanzees, the, the differences between humans and chimpanzees. Um, again, uh, I didn't quite... Uh, um, I, I, another example of, you know, there was, I was talking about how there was kind of two ways for us to sta understand sort of the human, um, uh, ourselves as humans, like what makes us human. And, um, you know, the study of uh, human mutation is also a very important component. So it's not just comparative genomics that's important. So, you know, I used the example of um, studying disease earlier, but, you know, a, a case study of that would be, you know, looking at something like Huntington's disease, um, which is a neurodegenerative disease. Um, where you have a mutation in a gene called Huntington. It affects about 30,000 people in the U.S. Um, the disease itself is autosomal and dominant. Um, symptoms in include uh, choreatic movements, or like dancer-like movements, mental disturbance, personality traits, intellectual impairment. Back, you know, a long time ago in colonial times, people with Huntington's were often like tried as witches and things like that because of their inability to control their body. Onset tends to happen um, a little bit later in life, but not very late, um, sort of the ages of 30 to 50, and death, uh, unfortunately, is not long after that. Um, 
and it wasn't until we got something like the human genome and uh, were able to sort of build up these genetic resources that we could kind of start to really understand what are the genetic factors that are driving this. And this is a good example where now we, if we know what the mutational patterns are, we can start to actually use that to, to help address and um, help people um, better understand what their health outcomes could be. So, um, you know, basically what this happens is you get an expansion of these um, CAG repeats. Um, and these CAG repeats are um, located within a specific exon of um, the Huntington uh, gene. Um, and what this does, um, you have these blocks of CAGs. And if you have um, a lot of them, the more that you have of them, uh, you should basically have 11 to 28 and it's somewhat normal but as you start to get more and more of them you start to get more and more symptoms so once you get above 35 you might have mild symptoms and above 41 um, people tend to um, demonstrate high risk they have high risk for developing Huntington's disease what is kind of it and, and so like there are now um, there are now ways to there are some ways to, to um, help treat Huntington's disease. Um, Huntington, Huntington, the protein though, it's still not 100% known what this gene does um, as it is. Uh, mostly we know it's involved in like ax axonal transport and brain development, but um, it's hard. Uh, it's not like we've um, necessarily been able to uh, completely ameliorate all the effects of this disease, but obviously now we're better able to help people understand what their risks are um, for developing something like this. Interestingly, um, one of the main research researchers in this um, uh, project was uh, a uh, actually at risk for this and never got her own sequence assessed um, and managed to avoid uh, having any symptoms of it. I think these examples too of you know, study using genetics to study disease have shown, you know, just how much the human genome sequence has affected medicine. Um, you know, uh, in terms of disease prevention, vaccine development, um, you know, the one of the most important things in vaccine development is that we actually know the sequence of the of the ideological agent of the thing that's causing the disease in order to develop a vaccine for it. It also has been incredibly important for um, things like understanding genetic predispositions, um, understanding how specific mutations can can uh, lead to specific outcomes. Um, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine, it, it would not have been done without genome sequencing. Um, and, and that's just how it is. Uh, and, and the way that it has been done is really just a testament to how far we've we've come in terms of biotechnology. Um, it's also been super important for uh, detection and pre precise diagnosis. Um, there are a lot of rare diseases out there that you will never be able to, you would be, have, it'd be really, really difficult to diagnose until you had um, uh, the ability to um, uh, 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 to look at someone's genome sequence. I, I just think of um, I used to serve on a board for a, men a regional mental health agen agency in Connecticut. And one of the members uh, was a doctor at a local hospital. And, and he had told me a story about um, they had had a patient who they had kept prescribing various medications to. And you know, a lot of people who are experience mental illness are on a lot of different medications. And it, it, it's really hard on them um, and those medications can have a really big a lot of detrimental effects to their health um, and so finding the right medication making sure that you know there are as few medications as necessary is a really important component to uh, um, to their physical and mental health um, you know people who have mental illness a lot of i think the the estimates are they live about 25 years le less than the average person um, so he had this patient and um, he was giving the patient, prescribing various um, uh, drugs to help the patient, and every time the patient would have a, a terrible reaction, and they'd have to try something else. And terrible reaction, try something else. 
And so over time, he had his suspicions, but he wasn't sure. So he, he ended up sending her out for um, for uh, <laughs> exome sequencing, where they just sequenced the protein sequences in the genome. And basically what he found in that is that she was missing, she had a mutation in a gene that did not allow her to effectively process uh, basically what was Pepto-Bismol. So she, he, she would take um, her, her normal uh, prescribed medicine, but then she, it would upset her stomach, so she would take something to settle her stomach. And that was causing her adverse reaction, right? So that changed everything. So now, you know, they could actually prescribe her the drugs that she need, prescribe her something for her stomach that would not be rejected from her body, and her outcomes were way different and way better. So you, you can just see, like, that's the kind of thing that would be incredibly difficult for a doctor to pick up without something like a genome sequence. Um, he had his he had his suspicions, but he's like it, it made all the difference to him. And you can think about if you can do that, how much money and time and effort it can save somebody by being able to to, to do that. How much pain and suffering it can save someone too, um, in those cases. So it really could could be a game changer when it comes to medicine. Um, genetic counseling is also a, a really important uh, way that that is involved in uh, the intersection of genomics and medicine, um, counseling for people on the risks that they might have for things like cancer, um, various types of heritable diseases that they could that that could be passed on. Um, there are a variety of different ways that this can can manifest and um, there are more and more of these tools that are becoming approved by the FDA to be allowable for um, discussion as we start to better understand the genetics that underlie a lot of these diseases. So it's a whole different area now where, where we can actually um, use genetic information to help guide our decision making. Um, it can also uh, be a really important way for discovering and implementing an, an effective treatment. Um, I gave the example before um, uh, but you know, there's lots of cases where um, they, you might have an individual with a rare disease that they don't know what uh, the factor is that drives that disease. And, and you won't be able to actually even identify what is different about that individual as compared to others unless you do a genome sequence. Um, so you may not even know what the variants that are associated with whatever disease this individual is um, experiencing are. So hugely important. Um, another, you know, a, a cool think example of when we think about discovering implementation of effective treatment is, um, you know, when we have um, a, a, a unique feature to, um, a, there's some sort of a metabolic feature that's unique to a pathogen. Um, we have to, uh, you know, Tar figure out what the target is for some sort of agent to treat that thing. Um, we've got to define what the structure is that of that target is. We then have to design a, a drug for that structure or target. Um, and what that process looks like, right, in terms of drug development, um, that that pharma pharmacogenomics process. Um, Basically, when we can take a genomic approach to it, we can, instead of having to go through and do um, a lot of pre-work and, and not have a good sense of where to start and what are our targets and what should they look like, we can actually study a patient's genes and proteins, which, which can then help us actually optimally select for drugs and dosages for uh, individuals or patients. And the really interesting about this is, right, like it helps us avoid the need for experimentation. We can eventually get to the point where we can predict individual responses. Um, you know, in the past, we had to go through a process where we would have patients that all present similar symptoms and we'd all give them the same diagnosis and the same therapy. Um, but now we can, with pharmacogenomics, right, we can figure out, you know, which ones uh, may have, um, the drug might be toxic, which isn't ideal, but it could be beneficial to them, right? But our ideal is we find like a case where, we, where so someone wouldn't have a toxic effect, um, but it would be beneficial. It's also very important, right, that we understand the cases where the drug is toxic and not beneficial, because we wouldn't want to give people drugs, those drugs in that case. 
as well as um, where um, the drug may not be toxic, but it's not would not be beneficial. I think a classic case of this is if you think about like cancer and the different types of cancer, you know, um, for breast cancer, for instance, you know, there's HER2 positive, there's HR positive, ER positive, and triple negative. For all of those, there are very specific antibody treatments or different types of treatments that can be used for different types of cancer. It's really important that we know which one so that we can apply the right drug. It might be toxic, but beneficial, or in, in some cases, it's, it's not toxic and it's still beneficial. But there are lots of cases where we, if we apply to HER2 positive drug to an individual who is ER positive, right, we end up with a case where we'd have the, the gene, the drug would not be beneficial. And that would be not our ideal outcome. Uh, I think a simpler case um, <laughs> for an example of where this could work too, just, and this is a kind of a silly case, but it shows how genome sequencing can matter, is if we look at a gene like P5, P450, which is an important gene for metabolizing drugs, uh, and when you have mutations in it, um, and, and in this case, uh, there was a site mutation in this, in this genome um, at this position, right? So you're supposed to be an S and there was a P there. Um, and uh, what that, what that means is that you can lose some of the function of the gene and it can lead to drug toxicity or overdose uh, dangers for individuals that have um, the mutations or loss of function mutations in this gene. So basically what happens is that that, doesn't, that person doesn't work as well and then drugs will build up in the system, right? It's very dangerous. Well, the person whose genome this is is actually James Watson. Right, the guy who helped discover DNA. He got his genome sequenced as part of being like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm gonna have my genome used as a reference genome sequence, kind of a, a, a fun thing, right? Well, they did his genome sequence and they figured out that he had this mutation in cytochrome P450. And at the time, he was actually taking beta blockers for high blood pressure, um, and he found out that it was making himself drowsy. And so because of the fact that they did his genome sequence, they were able to actually drop, they, they were able to think, say like, oh, we should probably drop his dosage. Um, and, and that's what they did. So after the genome sequence, they dropped his dosage of beta blockers and he actually did a lot better after, afterwards. So it's just a, a, you know, it's not a life-changing example necessarily, but it's, it's a good example of how this can help improve people's lives. And um, there's other ways for us to leverage uh, information on mutation. So, you know, a lot of popular applications include uh, paternity testing, um, genealogy, understanding your ethnic background, health risks, even finding um, uh, romantic partners through, <laughs> through um, genome sequencing. And of course, these are all, you know, 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, um, these kinds of things. And I'll say, like, you know, I, I actually was involved. Uh, these have really big, can have really big legal um, uh, um, implications. So, you know, um, uh, we had Barbara Ray Venter come and t speak to our class uh, one year, uh, this class, and she's one of the people who helped find the, um, the Golden State Killer through using these online <laughs> databases like Ancestry and um, 23andMe and things like that. Um, uh, so we can use them for crime scene investigation, right? They're, they're a great way to do forensic science. But um, I was involved actually in a case where we used it to help get somebody um, citizenship in the U.S. Um, by basically finding their, uh, their parent who was a, a U.S. service person um, and uh, was his biological father. And because of that, he was able to um, actually... Uh, uh, we were able to use Ancestry.com data to validate that he was in fact this person's biological uh, son and therefore get um, get uh, him recognized as a U.S. citizen. It was complicated. It was actually by treaty because he was born in Germany. So in Germany, if you were um, born to a U.S. citizen and a German citizen, then you have dual citizenship um, by law. And so he actually should have had dual citizenship. Um, there are a variety of reasons why that wasn't done at the time, but um, basically it helped him get his citizenship, which is a pretty pretty cool thing. One of the first cases where um, the courts have accepted 20, uh, ancestry uh, DNA data as uh, as legitimate in in the courts. Uh, 
And then, you know, we also, uh, you know, they use DNA for forensic science. Obviously, you've all seen all the crime scene investigation shows. Hugely important for that. Um, and then, you know, one of the big things, and we're not going to talk a lot about CRISPR-Cas9, but, you know, because um, we're more focused in on comparative genomics, but using uh, this, this system for genetic engineering where we can actually go through and clip out and manipulate DNA is going to be hugely important. It's going to be important for medicine. You know, they're using it right now to do things like treat cystic fibrosis. Um, but it's also going to be important for all kinds of other applications, for agricultural applications, for conservation biology applications, for epidemiological uh, applications. It's going to be really important for a lot of things. So um, there's also a lot of um, interesting issues around it and ethical issues around it. Um, but it's a it's going to really it's going to have a big effect on society at some point. So that's my little lecture on um, the human genome and some of the ways that we've used it and where we've ended up with it and uh, look forward to talking to you in class about it.